Hey, what up, everybody? Kit the Beat Talk, aka the Xeno Hunter here. Skinwalkers. Things that are able to change their form at will. Shapeshifters are a prevalent feature in cultures all over the world. Shapeshifters are a part of multiple cultures, including Inuit mythology. In Inuit mythology, uh, they talk about things like the skinwalker that can mimic voices and lure people into the woods. It's not just a story from the Navajo people. It's actually happening in places like the Arctic. Common shapeshifter tropes around the world are stuff like skinwalkers, werewolves, uh, were hyenas, and other creatures of that sort creatures that are able to morph from man to animal or animal to man or be a combination of anything in between. The shape-shifting narrative, the idea that beings can shape-shift into other things, is very multicultural. I am Inuit, I'm Eskimo. An isolated people, the last people to be westernized. We were the last frontier, we we're the final frontier, the Inuit people, the Eskimo people. And here is Inuit mythology about shapeshifters. Check it out. In the frozen wilderness of the Arctic, a chilling legend weaves its way through the culture and fears of the Inuit people. It is the legend of the Ijurak, the enigmatic shapeshifters that dwell in a place caught between two worlds, neither fully part of this one nor entirely out of it. The name Ijirak translates to shapeshifter in North Baffin dialects, a name that these creatures embody with their ability to assume any form they choose, be it wolf, raven, or even human. They often assume the form of a caribou, their true appearance hiding a human-like form with sideways eyes and mouth, a sight only truly known to the shaman. No matter what form they take, their eyes remain an eerie red, a telltale sign of their true nature. Their elusive nature makes them particularly deceptive, sometimes appearing as shadow people or a strange caribou glimpsed out of the corner of the eye. But if you try to observe them directly, they vanish, leaving only confusion and uncertainty in their wake. The Ijerae plural can be both helpful and fatally deceptive, their motives as shifting as their forms. One place that stands out for sightings of these shapeshifters is Freeman's Cove, an area of Tuktusirvik on Bathurst Island, surrounded by dormant volcanic mountains. Historically, it has been a notable stopover for Arctic expeditions, adding an air of mystery and adventure to an already enigmatic region. The facilities of the Ija Rock are diverse and haunting. Most Inuit folk tales tell of children and young hunters being captured. But one tale stands out, a story that brings the nature of these mysterious creatures to life. Whilst traveling alone in a snowstorm one evening, an Inuit shaman became surrounded by the Ijirak, whose intimidating red glowing stare sent shivers down his spine. The shaman convinced them that he was no threat to them, but refused their offer when they asked him to join forces with them. This angered the Ijirak, who attacked the shaman and physically overbore him. The shaman fought back with the help of his friendly spirits, but it was futile, and soon he was left unconscious and was carried to the home of the Ijirak. Whilst there, the Ijirak saw a better side of the creature, as one of the female Ijirak agreed to free him on the basis that she could see him again. The shaman returned home, but the memory-stealing powers of the Ijirak began to take effect and he soon had little recollection of the whole event. The Adrak haunted the shaman for the rest of his days, and when he was on his deathbed, he remembered vividly the experience he had. After they returned to revel in his mortal pain, he agreed to join the creatures instead of going to heaven. It is because of this that many believe the Iraq to be the spirits of recently deceased folk. The home of the Ijiraeit is said to be cursed, a maze where even the most skilled can lose their way. Their dwelling is a haunted labyrinth, ensnaring those who venture too close. The legend of the Ijirak resonates through the Arctic landscape, a haunting reminder of the unknown, a chilling testament to the power of myth and memory. It's a tale that lingers long after it's told, a spectral echo in the vast and icy wilderness, an intricate weave of fear, fascination, and timeless intrigue to, whether seen as shadowy figures in the corners of one's eyes or recounted by elders who fear their presence. 
the Ijirak remain an enigmatic and ever-present force in the Arctic, a story that continues to captivate and terrify. It said that they can be shadow people. Red eyes are prevalent in many, many paranormal stories. Skinwalkers, dogmen, uh, shadow people, strange creatures, blah, blah, blah. Glowing eyes, glowing eyes, glowing eyes. A trend that is repeated in multiple paranormal stories. Strange looking creatures, glowing eyes, glowing eyes, red, yellow, or orange. Glowing eyes, glowing eyes, glowing eyes. How do you tell if it's a shapeshifter? Oh, it has glowing red eyes. So you see a wolf, it looks like a wolf, but its eyes are glowing. And then the shadow thing. So as I was saying before, uh, I, I share information that most people don't know. So shadows, Bigfoot turn into shadow people. Little people turn into shadow people. It's like they melt into a shadow and then they're somewhere else and then they'll run away and all you'll see is a black shadow figure running. And you're like, oh, a shadow person. Or you see a shadow person and then these beings can go out of the shadow and come back into flesh, like physically. Like I talk about stuff like that and these shapeshifters are shadow people also and you can tell what they are because their eyes glow. So if they turned into a caribou or something else, the red eyes give them away and that's how you're able to spot if it's a shapeshifter. There's an interesting TikTok that I recently saw where I'll let you see it for yourself. So they say, we put my dog in the bathroom and acted like we left the house and this is what we saw. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So uh, that could just be a dog, you know, looking and you know, dogs can stand on their hind legs and open doors and I know they're able to do that. But that looked kind of creepy. It looked like it saw them and then it was like, oh crap. And it closed the door to try to cover itself up like it didn't want to be caught, which is weird. So I enhanced the video with AI. Let's check it out. Oh my God. All right. Oh my Look at how the eyes are glowing. And then it closed the door real quick like it's kind of guilty. Uh, this is up in the air. I'm not going to definitively say that's a shapeshifter, but <laughs> seeing as how they can blend or become be animals and live with people and then change into a different form whenever they want, it's possible that some people's pets are actually entities or creatures disguising as pets, disguising themselves as animals in order to live and do something in this world, maybe observe, who knows. If you put yourself in their shoes and you, like let's say you're part of Star Trek, like my shirt, Star Trek, and let's say you wanted to observe an alien world and you could shapeshift into something else and comfortably interact with them without them knowing, maybe being a dog would be a good way to kind of get to know how these people act. Can't say for sure, definitively, but I'm sure there's quite a few stories out there if I was to research it of dogs doing creepy stuff like speaking like humans and uh, looking like a person for a while then changing back into a dog or something. So according to Inuit mythology, shadow people can turn into, our shapeshifters can turn into shadows and they can turn into other animals just like the little people in Bigfoot, according to the native people that I talked to. Now let's go on to skinwalkers, the Navajo shapeshifters. The Navajo, or Dine, people of North America maintain a rich tradition of beliefs in magic and shapeshifting. The skinwalker, or Yi Nald Lushii, is a central figure in their culture echoing an extraordinary global phenomenon. This shadowy being, part of Navajo folklore, has resonated far across the American cultural landscape and beyond. 
Though often misunderstood as a mere werewolf trope, the Skinwalker's true nature belongs to something more profound, reflecting a universal human fascination with transformation. This concept of beings that blur the lines between human and animal, sacred and profane, is not unique to the Navajo culture. It finds parallels in traditions spanning various continents, times, and beliefs, possibly hinting at a shared human understanding or even the real existence of such entities. In Europe, the legends of werewolves present a strong corollary. From ancient Greece to modern-day tales, the werewolf symbolizes a duality within human nature and a fear of the wilderness. The Selkies of Scottish folklore, seals that can shed their skins to become human, embody themes of transformation and longing. Africa's diverse cultures offer a plethora of shape-shifting tales. The legends of were hyenas in North and East Africa narrate humans who can transform into hyenas, acting as a bridge between the known and the unknown. Meanwhile, West African folklore speaks of mystical beings capable of taking on various animal forms, symbolizing natural forces and cultural fears. Asian folklore, particularly in China and Japan, is rich with stories of fox spirits that can transform into beautiful women. These spirits often possess intelligence and magical abilities, and their stories explore themes of deception, wisdom, and sensuality. Back in North America, the Skinwalker holds a distinctive place within the Navajo folk belief. The anthropologist Clyde Cluckhon delved into the Navajo magical traditions in his 1944 book Navajo Witchcraft, acknowledging that the English term witchcraft might not fully encapsulate the unique attributes of the Navajo spirit world. He described Skinwalkers as secret witches, mostly male but also female, who take the form of swift-moving animals like wolves and coyotes. Their dark magic practices and taboo rituals resonate with the mysterious allure that shape-shifting beings hold in many cultures. A person becomes a Navajo skinwalker by committing a heinous act, gaining supernatural powers that allow them to shape-shift into various animals. Unlike some traditions, such as the cursed European werewolf, becoming a skinwalker is a deliberate act. They may take different animal forms based on specific needs like acquiring strength by becoming a bear. Skinwalkers also possess abilities to read minds, control nocturnal animals, and summon spirits of the dead. Their eyes glowing red or animal-like betray their presence. Within Navajo society, they have been blamed for everything from crop failures to sudden death reflecting societal fears and mysteries. The prevalence of shape-shifting stories across cultures might lead to the tantalizing speculation that these tales are more than mere folklore. Could they point to a universal truth or shared experience that transcends geographical and cultural boundaries? Could there be a basis in reality for these tales that have captivated human imagination for millennia? The ability to combat or overcome such beings also finds common ground across cultures. Whether through a powerful shaman, spells, or specific physical means, the struggle against shapeshifters reflects a universal human desire to understand and sometimes battle the unknown forces that lie just beyond our comprehension. All right, so one of the things that I hear a lot about the Skinwalker, including from one of my friends here, Nome, who saw one, he's Navajo, he used to live down, you know, where the Navajos live. And uh, he said he saw one once and it freaked him out. He said it was like a shadow figure with red eyes, just like Inuit mythology says, and it was a shadow. So shadow person, red eyes, red eyes, red eyes. And I can't help but think the color and the glowing of the eyes is an indication of some kind of scientific phenomenon that has to deal with the science of shamanism and magic and how it works. I can't help but think that. Like, there has to be a reason their eyes are red. If you can think of anything that might be able to help me understand, share your theories with me. Comment them in the comments below. Um, email me, thezenohunter at AOL.com and let me know because I'm open to other perspectives and other ideas. So a shadow person, a werewolf-like creature that looks like a dog man and can shapeshift and they're from evil people that do evil things and they can shapeshift and morph. Now, one of the things that I have to correct about this common misconception about the skinwalker is that they always have to be evil. This isn't true. A skinwalker doesn't necessarily have to be evil. I talked to some Navajo people in the past about this and they explained to me that that's a way uh, now that they do 
that the skinwalkers will shapeshift and become shapeshifters. They'll do a bunch of evil stuff so they can um, so they can gain this power. But a long time ago, they used to use skinwalkers or shapeshifting people as scouts. So a person would learn how to do it somehow, and there's no details on that. But they weren't necessarily evil. Like you can learn how to do it without being pure evil. Like it's not necessarily, oh, you you can shapeshift. You're pure evil. I think there's like many paths like a nuclear bomb can be used for evil or it could be used for good or you can become a great fighter because you want to kill people or you can become a great fighter because you want to defend people just because something's possible with evil intent doesn't mean that it has to have evil intent is my point so there's two common factors with these with the inuit mythology and the navajo shadow like people a lot of uh, stories about skinwalkers say that they have red eyes and with that let's go on to the next story so this one is about a skinwalker a dog that was actually a skinwalker and transformed in front of people i decided to join my best friend karen for a three-day stay at her grandmother's place on the navajo reservation near tuba city arizona surrounded by rural homes in the middle of nowhere. It promised a fascinating insight into Navajo tradition, something I was keen to learn about during our break from college. The first day of our visit was pretty relaxed and nothing out of the ordinary occurred. However, Karen's grandmother, who was only around 67, mentioned that a stray dog had appeared out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, this dog behaved strangely and looked rather ugly with its black shaggy coat an appearance resembling a mix between a German Shepherd and a Labrador. That night, while we were watching a movie, Karen spotted the stray dog standing on top of the wood box outside, staring at us through the window. A very unusual behavior for a dog. Karen scared it away, but it returned later when we were out shopping. The bizarre incidents escalated when we returned home. Around 5 o'clock, we heard someone trying to open the door. Looking out the window, we were shocked to see the dog standing on its hind legs, attempting to open the door with its paws. Although I found it odd, Karen was genuinely freaked out and chased the dog away again. After telling her grandmother about the incident, we got ready for bed, but the night was far from peaceful. We heard pitter-patter footsteps on the roof, scratching sounds, and strange barking that morphed into an unmistakably human male voice, mimicking a dog's bark. It was a terrifying sound and we were both on edge. Peering through the curtains, we saw the stray dog again, but this time it had an even more sinister appearance. Its eyes resembled glossy spider eyes, and its paws looked like deformed human hands with thick, sharp fingernails. We were both horrified, and our screams brought Karen's grandmother running, armed with ashes from the fireplace and a shotgun. She went outside to confront the creature, shouting in Navajo and telling it to leave. The next day, they called a medicine man to bless the place and provide us with protection. He explained that the dog was a skinwalker or Yoshi, a being that had killed the stray dog and used its body to create an illusion. He also mentioned that skinwalkers could harm people by using a bone straw to spit deadly fragments into them. Shockingly, he proceeded to pull a two-inch piece of human skull from Karen's grandmother's shoulder, a tangible and terrifying proof of the supernatural encounter. He gave us traditional protection items, including an arrowhead and corn pollen pouch, and conducted a ceremony to ward off any lingering malevolence. The entire experience was intense and otherworldly. Being exposed to Navajo traditions in such a vivid and haunting way left an indelible mark on both Karen and me. The realization that we had faced something far beyond our understanding was both humbling and terrifying, and the protection provided by the medicine man remains a treasured and symbolic reminder of our brush with the unknown. All right, so a human or some kind of creature pretending to be a dog and sneaking into places, turning, morphing in front of them, coming out and putting its hand paws on the window and just generally a creepy experience and sounds kind of scary one of the questions i have is what's the motive for the dog to bother them was it just trying to harm them was it a contract killer i've heard from navajo people that skinwalkers or people some of them at least 
and they get hired basically to do hits on people, to curse them or cause them misfortune. So if someone hates someone, they'll hire one of these shamans to turn into an animal and come and attack people or something. But this doesn't. This last story doesn't really follow any of the narratives from the from the previous explanations from folklore about them being shadows or having glowing red eyes. It just talks about something that was shape shifting. But just because, I mean, it could have been a missed detail, or their eyes might necessarily not always glow red. Hard to say. I'm not an expert. It's not like I know skinwalkers and I interact with them, so I know all the nuances of the science behind when their eyes are red or aren't. You know what I mean? It's a mystery to me. It could be that there's different types of shapeshifters, and this one wasn't the same as the other one. All right, here's another story about a shapeshifting wolf-like man that some kids encountered. I spent a month with my cousins at my grandma's house in August. The ages of my cousins ranged from 10 to 15, and I, being the oldest at 15, stayed with the 10, 13, and 14-year-olds. We often stayed up late, telling scary stories. But one night, a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house is situated in a rural suburb, the neighbors aren't too close when driving down the road to her house, but the backyard is thick forest with man-made paths weaving through it. Each house in the area is built on a hill, so only part of the basements are actually underground, a detail that would become significant later on. We set up our campfire towards the east side of the yard in a small patch of open land where the neighboring yards were out of sight. With about three quarters of a mile of my grandma's land on each side of us, we felt isolated in the darkness. It was close to 11 at night, and after telling some scary stories, we decided to play truth or dare. My 14-year-old cousin dared me and the 13-year-old to walk through the paths for 10 minutes or so. I agreed without hesitation, feeling level-headed and unafraid. My younger cousin was more hesitant, but we proceeded without flashlights since it wasn't pitch dark yet. Five minutes into our walk, just as the glow of the campfire was becoming faint through the trees, we decided to turn back. That's when we saw it. In the middle of the path was a large dog-like creature, hunched over, its front limbs only an inch from the ground. Its eyes were bright white, and its form was a horrifying blend of human and canine, a human-like head sat atop a dog-like body with human hands and feet. The creature looked right at us, and I was paralyzed with fear before it dashed away towards a creek that ran through the yard. Eventually, my cousin and I screamed in terror, and the others, along with my grandma, ran to us. My memory of the immediate aftermath is disoriented, but I woke up in bed later, so I assume I was brought back to the house. All the kids slept in the basement, and the next morning, I saw my cousins outside through the sliding glass doors. Eager to join them, I ran outside, only to find that they were running to get my grandma. Her dogs were both dead, brutally ripped apart. That night, we went to bed early, but I woke up around two in the morning when something hit my head. My cousins were all sitting silently, staring at me from the opposite side of the room, eyes filled with fear, following the direction of their gaze. I turned slightly and saw a horribly disfigured face pressed against the window, its gaping eyes looking down at me. I screamed in terror, and the creature bolted away. My grandma called the police, but they found nothing. After that incident, I went home, and I have never returned to my grandma's house during the night again. The memory of those white, unblinking eyes still haunts my dreams. So this story seems kind of like a mix between a human and a wolf or a human and a dog like in the middle of transformation. A lot like what you'd hear from werewolf stories. Skinwalker, something that can transform. Maybe this is what dogmen are.
Shapeshifters. There are stories of them from all over the world. Many sightings of them today. Many sightings. There are sightings all over the I could make multiple videos about shapeshifters, considering it's part of multiple cultures, and you could see the same trend from culture to culture to culture to culture, and see people talking about things shapeshifting from culture to culture to culture to culture. I think that it's a very real possibility. If you guys have any interesting stories or want to share anything with me, you can email at me at, at thezenohunter at aol.com or you can comment or you could hit up my Facebook group, The Zeno Hunter. Until next time, guys, peace out. This is Kitavitoa.